Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Sharon Davis, and I'm a Senior Enterprise Fellow with the Water, Environment and Agriculture Program at the University of Melbourne. And I have the great pleasure of being the MC for today's web panel discussion. Today, we're discussing sensing and analytics for precision agriculture, which um, I'm really looking forward to. I'd like to start though by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm hosting this webinar, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today's event is part of a regular series discussing the important issues surrounding water security where we aim to bring together thought leaders from academia, industry, and government to provide evidence-based insights and to raise the quality of debate around key issues. The Water Environment and Agriculture Group at the University of Melbourne works with industry, government and communities to find innovation and solutions to tackle water security and environmental challenges. And this is the second year of our highly successful series. And our past events have covered a broad range of issues, including diversification of water supplies, gender equality, impacts of bushfires, poor water quality on animal health, recent changes in rainfall and runoff, and COVID testing in, in wastewater, to name a few. If you'd like to learn more about the program or view any of the earlier seminars, please visit our website and the details are on the screen now. I'd also like to note that this event is being recorded and the video of the webinar will be put on the University of Melbourne's uh, School of Engineering webpage. And again, you can find that with the address uh, on the screen now. As part of today's discussion, our panel will be answering audience questions and I really encourage you to engage with the panel through the Q&A box within Zoom. I know many of us have been having a lot of experience with Zoom lately and while we can't all be in a room together, we would really encourage you to, to use that facility. You'll find the Q&A icon in the panel in the bottom of your page, as depending on your screen setup. And to submit your questions, just open the Q&A chat box and type your questions in, and we'll endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. To give a bit more of an introduction, my role as an Enterprise Senior Fellow includes building a bridge between academia, government and industry, and through those connections and exchange, create more positive outcomes for our sector as a whole. And our water security events are an important mechanism to create and strengthen these connections and to build better under, greater understanding in our sector. And before we proceed with the discussion then on sensing and analytics for precision agriculture, I'd really like to take the, this uh, moment to thank you for registering and for your participation in this webinar in, in building this greater understanding. It's great to have you here. Now, it's now my pleasure to introduce the panelists for today's events. So I'd like to start with Dr. Rose Broderick. She's the leader of CSIRO's WaterWise project. She has over 19 years of experience working with irrigators to develop management solutions in irrigated agriculture. Her research into crop physiology and agronomy has influenced production practices within Australia, within the Australian cotton industry. And Rose is a leader in the field of plant water relations and irrigation management, conducting research into assessment and development of new technologies for irrigation strategies where water is limited. Great pleasure to, to introduce you today, Rose. Do we have you there, Rose? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you. I'd next like to introduce Peter Moller. Peter's the Business Development Manager at Rubicon Water with experience in innovation in, ir in the in irrigated agricultural industry. He previously founded AgriLink Water Management and later co-founded Aquaspy. Peter's work involves commercialising a solution to automate surface irrigation and using data to interpret field conditions for connected sensors. And it's great to have you with us here today, Peter. Good to see Thank you. you. Thanks very great. much. Looking forward to the discussion. And finally, I'd like to introduce Professor Pablo Zarco. Uh, Pablo is a professor in pre precision agriculture and remote sensing, jointly appointed between the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences and the Melbourne School of Engineering at the University of Melbourne. 
His interests are related to high resolution, hyperspectral and thermal remote sensing imagery for crop, crop stress detection, it's a bit of a mouthful, uh, efficient irrigation and nutrient assessment using aircraft and remotely piloted aerial vehicles. Pablo, do we have you online? Yeah. Great, great to Thank see you. you. Thank you very Wonderful. much. Very nice to be here. Wonderful. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you um, here today. Before I um, turn to you with some questions, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time introducing the topic we're talking about today. So the sustainable use of water has been an important goal to meet its increasing demand for food, energy and environment. In Australia and many other parts of the globe, agriculture is the largest consumer of fresh water. And our current experience and projected changes in climate require more efficient use of water in agriculture to make food production stable and profitable. With the aid of fast developing sensing, sensing internet of things, big data and AI technologies, a wide range of innovations are actively being explored and tested to monitor crop water demands from individual crops to continental scales and to improve crop water productivity and eventually reduce the environmental footprint of agriculture. Our seminar panellists today work in R&D and industry sectors to develop and implement novel sensing techniques to improve agricultural water management. So before I turn to our panel members, I'd just like to once again invite our audience to uh, open the Q&A box uh, and whenever you like to start submitting questions, um, we'll, we'll start gathering those and, and turn to the panel. But first I'd like to um, start with you, Rose, if I could, and ask how much water is actually consumed by by the irrigated agricultural sector annually in Australia? <clears throat> Thanks, Sharon. So it goes up and down. And so last year, you can imagine with um, record droughts across much of the country, it was less. Um, but it usually, um, I guess the average is about 70% of all uh, water in Australia is used for agricultural purposes. And so last year, that was about, that was about 8 million megalitres of water, which is something like you know, 3.2 million swimming pools, if you want to use that comparison. Right, thank you. That's useful scene setting. Um, I'd like to turn to you now, Peter, and uh, if you could say, please, what's the current efficiency of irrigation water use uh, in Australia and, and where between reservoirs and dams can we improve that efficiency? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Look, um, according to the UN, um, less than 40% of the water diverted for agriculture is consumed by plants as productive water. And so um, as a commercial company, a, a water technology company with a global footprint, we're very focused on the end-to-end -end solutions for the water supply chain for irrigated agriculture. And so um, we, we look at um, the opportunities of solving these problems with our technologies to actually uh, double the volume of diverted water to become productive water. So to go from 40% to 80%, um, which could also be used for increasing food production or stored for future use or allocated for environmental use without affecting food production. And so we do that with a, a range of solutions that are connected devices, smart sensors, data analytics, computer modelling, all looking at changing conditions in real time for the water supply, the environment, the soil and the plants. And so we look at um, our technology uh, in the water supply chain in three areas. So distribution efficiency, um, where we have meters and gates and sensors and radios to measure and control water to deliver from the reservoir to the farm um, to an to transform efficiency from 50% to 90% delivery efficiency. The second area is application efficiency. So that's water uh, applied to the soil. And in gravity fed surface irrigation, that's about 50%. We're looking at transforming with our technologies of automation, sensors, adaptive control to increase that to 90% uh, application efficiency. And then through irrigation scheduling, uh, enabling thousands of irrigators um, to have the decision tools um, connected to their water ordering with irrigation districts with satellite imagery, forecasted evapotranspiration, predicting soil moisture deficit. So all, all that technology uh, coming together to help 
uh, the farmers to get the right date of irrigation and the right amount uh, to increase productivity and save water. So that's the opportunities that we look at. Great, thanks, Peter. So pretty uh, significant numbers there. Yeah, thank you. Um, Pablo, if I could turn to you now uh, and just ask you what technologies are available to improve irrigation efficiency but are still uh, in the process of being adopted? Sure. Um, first of all, I I like to to give a positive uh, view of uh, the progress that uh, we've made in the past, uh, I would say, 30 or more years. Um, I think that um, when we talk about um, improving irrigation efficiency and, and we talk about uh, technologies and methods to um, detect stress and to make decisions, I, I think that uh, one of the typical um, um, works that I like to um, uh, remind everyone is that uh, we've been trying to do that for more than 40 years. Um, and uh, some of the early work that uh, Jackson and others did in the 70s, um, where they were proposing using sensing technologies for monitoring crops, uh, I think that they are very important to put them in, in context um, because in some way what we're trying to do now is to continue that work that uh, was uh, started really, I would say, long time ago if we are talking in the times of technology. Um, the technology needed uh, development and we still need development, but 40 years ago, um, we needed uh, development, uh, particularly because uh, not all type of technologies would fit for all purposes. And uh, working in agriculture, we all know that uh, the demands and the requirements and the ways of detecting stress, water stress, is not the same uh, depending on the crop and the conditions in which uh, we are working. Um, I think that uh, the progress made on understanding, sensing indicators of water stress have been, this progress has been absolutely critical because we need to understand, if we have to make decisions, we need to understand that we need data that uh, will allow us to make decisions, but also data that will be meaningful and that uh, we are directly monitoring the processes that we need. I think that is widely accepted in general that uh, the most direct link between sensing technologies and um, um, water stress is actually um, canopy transpiration and that canopy temperature has been proposed long ago as a way, as a direct link and as the direct way of understanding the water requirements and therefore to make decisions. The problem and the reason why we are still in progress is because uh, for many years there has been a lack of spatial detail in sensors that uh, would allow us to collect data in the way we need it. This is critical particularly for tree orchards, for example, where highly efficient methods of irrigation are needed. There is a lack of understanding sometimes of the available remote sensing products and we put in the same bag all the remote sensing products that are available and they are very different from each other and they cannot be widely used. Um, there is a limited um, experience in urban remote sensing and in other type of technologies that came uh, recently, and we can talk later on today as well, which are based on drones and other unmanned uh, vehicles and methodologies that uh, are very efficient in some way, but are also limiting. And uh, the reason why you are still, we are still in progress in some cases is because we have demonstrated that we have methods and technology that can be used, but there is no fast processing methodologies that would allow us to answer in real time or near real time in order to make decisions and to answer uh, about these limitations. Great, thanks Pablo. 
So you've, you've started to touch, I think, on some of the, um, some of the barriers. And, and I guess I've, I can see questions coming in now. So um, uh, to the, audi to the um, audience, it's great to see um, those questions coming in. Um, there was one that I really like to ask to each of the panelists, and that's about um, what are the barriers that have influenced the slow adoption? And what have we learned from those experiences? Maybe I'll go to you first, Rose. If, if you'd like to answer that, sure. And 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 so I think I think what we need to to think about here in this, this part of the discussion is we, we're fairly talking about technology in general. Um, and, and one of the issues um, I was touched on, you know, the um, suitability of the technology for. Um, you know, spatial precision management. Um, but one, I guess one of the, the, the general barriers to adoption is that um, for farmers is that things are, farming is complex. Um, adoption, so I'll probably actually use an example of auto steer on tractors as a better example of what, you know, that, that technology was around um, for a while. It was difficult to install. It took some time. Once John Deere rolled that out in their tractors as something that you just kind of, turned on and, and, it, and it worked and the same as yield monitors, other technology, once it got to a point of um, simple, simple integrated into, I guess, the systems that they're using, that's when you see technology take off. And one of the, um, the, the things about, the, the things that drive the adoption of the technology is, you know, how transparent is it that it's going to have a benefit to me versus the complexity of using it. Um, the irrigation industry in particular has what I would call competing technologies, um, similar to, to the um, chemical industry for farmers as well. So, so where things aren't integrated and if you have to, you're looking at this system and that system. Um, and we wouldn't say, I agree with Pablo, we wouldn't say it's new. So irrigators have been using sensors and technology and wireless technology for 20, over, over 20 years now. Um, and if, you know, I think the question we, 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 we often forget to ask is what are their problems? What problems do they have? How can we solve them? And when we go and ask those questions of irrigators, it's so they want something that's integrated. They want something that they don't have to think about. They need it to be able to have prediction capability. So where I'm not certain um, and, and, and allow them to evaluate the risk. And so the simpler, the, you know, the, the, the technology can be complex and, and I wouldn't pretend to know how my iPhone works, um, but the interface of, of that needs to be, to be simple and, and um, and then the investment and the uptake of a technology um, takes off, and and also the need. And so, for example, BT cotton, genetically engineered cotton, is a good example in a, in a non-irrigated context. Is the need was great for something in that system, um, and so the uh, adoption of that technology, a lot of the barriers were overcome. But I think you know just remembering that that that, that um, there's a social aspect to farming. Um, complexity and integration um, is 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 the key, and, and making it a transparent. But there's there's some benefit to to adding this to the system to the complexity of farming as it is in general. Great, thank you, uh, Peter. Do you would you like to make a statement in relation to the the barriers and? What we've learned. Yep, yep. Look, um, Rubicon's um, you know, been involved for 25 years working with irrigation districts. And so um, what we've been able to do is address the compelling needs of the irrigation districts to be able to measure water in open canals. We've been innovative. We've developed measurement and devices and structures that can measure high volumes of water in open canals. Um, we've also eliminated the labour component um, we've also eliminated spills and losses out of the system to transform the delivery side, you know, from 50% to 90%. And as a consequence, um, we pretty much got a very high adoption rate of our technologies with irrigation districts uh, in Australia. Most of the districts here in Australia use our technology as the enabling management system to del deliver, measure, control water um, through tens of thousands of kilometres of open canal, supplying about 16,000 irrigators. And so that's, you know, the compelling need is really important to understand. And then we're working on how do we connect that 
now to the irrigators and on farm. And there's an opportunity there. And how do we get solve the needs of the irrigators. So making it more accurate to predict when to water, providing irrigation decision applications embedded in their water ordering tools with the district to determine when to water and how much to apply, you know, using the technologies of satellite imagery, climate, soil moisture, crop stage modeling and growth and yield prediction, bringing it all together to make it easy for to, to adopt. And low cost is always the thing with uh, on farm as well. So being competitive yeah. in that area. Great, thank you. I might just lead on to um, another question. Um, um, Sharon, if, if you allow me. Um, sorry, it, Pablo, can I, I'll circle back to you sure. if that's okay. I've just got Definitely. another question for Peter that just flowed on. So I was Definitely. being a bit <laughs> agile there. I just wanted to ask you, Peter, just sort of leading on, do you see, there's a question here, do you see a progressive move to AI based predictive and potentially prescriptive delivery to designated crop plantings, um, minimising grower directed orders for water. And um, the next part of that is impact on grower training and service provision could be radical. But I guess the question is about AI influencing that. Yep, yep. Sure, sure. It's certainly um, uh, work that we've done over the last 20 odd years is actually in collaboration with the University of Melbourne. Uh, where we've used modelling to simulate water flows and open canals. So using optimization tools and and uh, a whole range of data sets to predict what the water will be going through the canals. The next step is then using that uh, on farm. And so the integration of data from multiple sets and then repeating that on each irrigation cycle and measuring and documenting and learning from that and then using the computer systems for machine learning and, and AI to actually help come up with more accurate predictions of when to water and how much to apply. So we're certainly looking at that. We're working with uh, actually the University of Melbourne in that space as well uh, on farm. So it's certainly that's the area that is the next phase of, of um, helping. And that's the irrigation scheduling component, getting that right, because we see that's low hanging fruit and there's a big opportunity to help save water and, and increase yield and improve quality. Great, thank you. Sorry, Pablo. So turning to you now, um, just coming back again around to the barriers that influence slow adoption and what we've learned from the experience. Did you want to make some comments on that? Sure. Just wanted to agree with Rose and Peter about what they said and add um, a view that probably it's coming from my, my experience working in Europe in arid and semi-arid um, environments and in southern European countries where the high variability in, um, in um, climate conditions uh, from across years, um, uh, it's really um, a pro and a con at the same time uh, because uh, we've seen that uh, government and research institutions uh, for some years suddenly they are very interested on pushing research on aspects related to um, sensing technologies and precision irrigation and precision use of uh, and high efficiency of uh, water use. But um, the, this high variability makes that uh, from five years to the next, uh, the situation changes and the water availability changes as well and it's no longer of interest so this variability which should be actually um, lead um, the need for efficient ways of using water in ir for irrigation is actually in some cases a, a, a disadvantage i think that um, if we talk about the specific case of um, um, horticultural tree crops and the need for high efficiency um, and technology for irrigation. Um, sensing technologies sometimes have been oversold. And I think that we are now, and in the last uh, few years, um, being in some way um, punished uh, by the fact that uh, this overselling of remote sensing is n not attracting um, methods which are feasible and customers and, and users, potential, potential users, who could be using the remote sensing technology for their purposes. I think that um, once we see that uh, remote sensing from satellites, for example, it's been 
demonstrated suboptimal in some cases because not all type of technologies are valid for all type of agriculture. Um, suddenly we forget that there are alternatives and suddenly we forget that um, new technologies that become available need to be adapted to those conditions. Detection is not the same than decision making and we need to go from the detection of a stress and water stress, we need to go from there to making a decision about how much water we need to apply and where. And this is where we've been lacking in for some years in the understanding and in the modeling of uh, those processes. Um, perhaps we can talk about it a bit later, but I think that this new revolution in drones that uh, has been announced and that many um, uh, people who are listening right now are aware of um, didn't really meet some of the expectations in some cases in some cases because of legal aspects other ones because of technology but anyway we can talk about that later if if, if you feel that's an important issue because the revolution in new technologies not always have been transferred to final users in a positive way Thank you, Pablo. Um, so leading on from that then, I, I guess I just pause for a moment and say to our audience, it's great to see some questions coming in. So please do um, feel free to send questions into the audience, um, uh, sorry, into the, um, into the panelists. I guess I just wanna uh, turn to one of those questions now and take a bit of a step back for a moment. And the question is, well, the point is Australia has very good uh, what is sufficiency compared to the rest of the world? And we've touched a little bit on this, but what are the low hanging fruit? Uh, what is the low hanging fruit to improve water use efficiency in Australia? Does anyone want to address that question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll let you go, Rose, and then I'll follow. Oh, I, I was just going to say um, so, Peter said that the average UM water use efficiency is about 38%. And um, our average water use efficiency across Australia is about 40. So that I'll answer that first part of the question that that, that, that if we start talking specifically um, field farm certain areas um, and, and I think perhaps if we're in the water space um, there also is some contention about perhaps some of the water is is um, going missing that we read last week. But, but I think Peter is very well placed to um, talk about it as a system. So I think that we, we often focus very much on a granular thing of, oh, that farm application water use efficiency has improved. Um, but if we're thinking nationally and about having water available uh, for producing more food, or more for the environment, we need to think about the whole system. And, and I'll throw to Peter to talk about, um, I know Rubicon has very, very good visibility across that systems context. Yeah, so on the delivery side, we've really focused on accurate measurements, you know, plus or minus 2% of the volume of water right through that supply chain from diversion to on farm. So all our customers, irrigation districts now can accurately account for water that they've diverted and they, they have accurately supplied to farms. So that's sort of been well adopted. Um, the next area is the opportunities to improve application efficiency on farm. Um, and in collaboration with We've automated surface irrigation, but we're also working with subsurface drip irrigation companies, working with centre pivot mechanised irrigation companies, collaborating together and, and bringing, integrating that data and sharing data. So working with other vendors into a single platform is certainly an opportunity. Um, and certainly the irrigation scheduling. You know, we've seen the cotton industry have a high adoption of soil moisture measurement uh, to schedule, and we've seen them benefit from increasing um, water use or uh, tons grown or bales grown per megalitre. I think across the board, there's other, other irrigated agricultural commodities that could benefit from, from learning from that. So irrigation scheduling. And you know, with the technologies now, with satellite imagery, um, forecasted evapotranspiration, also having lower cost localised weather sensors within a kilometre of every farm uh, in, in the Murray-Darling Basin to provide actually what's happening you know, in each field um, and, and machine learning and all that sort of stuff integrated together. I think we can give farmers the tools to be more accurate and precise on when to water, and then uh, very good at applying water uh, with high efficiency. Great, thank you. 
Pablo, did you want to add anything from the low-hanging fruit perspective? Well, I, I agree with uh, Peter's comment. Uh, just would like to add that uh, in some cases, because of the year-to-year -year variability and the within field variability in, in some specific uh, orchards where we have um, variability that sometimes we don't uh, really understand, um, high-resolution um, remote sensing data um, are needed and sometimes that's not provided necessarily by um, satellite data currently available and um, so that's my comment uh, that I said before about not all type of sensing technologies are valid for all same cases and uh, we need to optimize it and use it properly in order to be able to um, detect stress um, at the tree level or at the plant level um, without effect uh, due to the soil or to any other um, sources. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Pablo, just staying on you for a moment, you mentioned this a bit earlier and I just want to come back to it. You, you were talking about drones and my question is that new technologies such as drones uh, are considered a revolution in precision ag, but what are the prospects and limitations of this technology for precision ag? Yeah, um, I, I think that um, in the last uh, two, 10 years or so, uh, I think that drones have been considered, um, I would say, a new revolution in, in agriculture. And uh, I don't want to be negative about it. Uh, in fact, uh, I think that I, my group was one of the very first ones uh, flying drones in agriculture uh, back in Europe. And we also did it in California, in the US and some other countries. And um, we showed uh, how reliable and um, efficient uh, we could be with uh, drones. Um, there's no doubt about the prospect and about the positive aspects. Uh, fraction of the cost, we can get very high resolution imagery very frequently. And uh, I think that uh, not only us, but uh, the community ha has demonstrated that we could eventually do a weekly, even if we wanted a daily um, a monitoring of uh, water stress levels. And uh, this has been demonstrated already so absolutely no, no issues about the pros and the aspects that are positive. But um, I'm quite uh, critical sometimes with the fact that uh, uh, drones have been seen uh, or proposed as a solution for everything in agriculture. And it reminds me what some of the, my supervisors in Canada and the US when I was uh, studying there told me that happened in the, in the 80s with um, satellite remote sensing. Satellite remote sensing in the 80s were going to, re to, to solve all the environmental problems that we had in, uh, around the world. And I don't think that happened. It helped, obviously, but they were not the solution for everything. Um, I think that the typical picture that uh, we see everywhere is the farmer holding a drone. And that is a very typical picture of how simplistic or how simple the whole idea has become is that if you are a farmer and you need to detect a stress or detect any disease or whatever you need to do in your farm, you buy a drone and you are set. And, and I think that's a very limiting point of view. Um, I think, in fact, I have to say that um, remote sensing carried out from drones has been an actual a step back in remote sensing science because we are currently limiting ourselves to the sensors that we can fly in a drone. I have seen many cases where I've been approached by industry and they say, well, I wanted to fly whatever sensor because that's what I need, but my drone cannot fly it. So I'm not going to fly it. I cannot fly, so let's forget about it. The fact is that 90% of the vendors and industry flying drones are using technology which is supposed to be new, but is the same as we were doing 30 years ago, which is 
getting NDVI images for anyone working in remote sensing knows what NDVI is. NDVI is an indicator of growth, of plant growth and vigor. And I'm not saying it's useless, it's useful. But if now in the year 2020, we the solution is a drone that flies NDVI or RGB images, I mean, images in the uh, true color, then I think that we are really going backwards, not forward. So I think that uh, drones are a solution as long as we can fly the most advanced technologies on board, on board those drones and that it's not, they are not an actual limitation of the things that we were doing before the drones arrived so we can actually progress and continue. The objective 10, 15 years ago when we were starting flying the first drones was that, was to fly. I mean, we wanted to fly and we were praying at the same time so it wouldn't crash. Um, we are not at that stage anymore and that's very good, but the objective is not to fly and the objective is not to collect data. The objective is the methods and the algorithms that we can apply to the data sets that we have collected in order to get meaningful products that can be useful for someone to make a decision about how much water needs at each particular time and place. Great. Thanks, Pablo. Um, I, I want to turn to some questions coming in from our audience now. Um, I guess in some ways building off new technologies, What is the, the question here is, what are the current state-of-the-art development projects and available commercial offerings for water analytics and or predictive modelling of water in a paddock situations. So, um, would someone like we've got a, Would someone like to answer that question? Well, uh, I would like to say that uh, one thing is the technology that is currently used and and offered by industry or through um, remote uh, through research groups in. Um, institutions uh, worldwide. Another different thing is what we are actually progressing on research and one of the aspects that we're trying to do is to um, go beyond the detection of um, water stress using the most direct link between canopy transpiration and uh, canopy temperature um, and water potential through um, um, through canopy temperature, but it's actually trying to um, collect data that allow us to understand physiological processes beyond transpiration rates and changes in transpiration, like for example, photosynthetic effects, reduction in photosynthesis using more advanced indicators, which are for example, chlorophyll fluorescence or pigments that either degrade or change because of the stress levels. And the importance of doing that is because sometimes we are no longer interested on understanding how much water is needed. We need to understand what is the effect of that stress and what is the effect on the, for example, grain quality. Um, if we want to go in that direction, then we need to get not only direct proxies for transpiration and water requirements, but we also need photosynthesis related and more physiology based indicators comprising all the aspects of the transpiration photosynthesis um, link. So th those would be one of some of the aspects. Um, fluorescence in other spectral regions are shown as an early detection of stress. The earliest we detect it, the better in order to make decisions as soon as possible without uh, compromising um, growth and uh, potential uh, quality. Thanks, Pablo. <clears throat> Rose, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, and for those who know me as well, they know that thermal sensing is 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 the focus. And I think the the real um, plant based sensing um, and predictive analytics is the focus. And so, in terms of uh, stuff that's commercially out there now, um, CSIRO and CRDC and Cotton have delivered uh, to a company called Goana Ag a canopy temperature sensing sensing um, algorithm and predictive algorithm. So in terms of analytics around that canopy temperature sensing, 
um, and like Pablo, the uh, continuous monitoring of the plant and understanding how it's interacting with its environment, um, along with the weather and the soil, um, is 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 where we see it. Um, I guess the continued um, innovation in terms of making sure that we can um, not only prevent stress, but in some crops um, uh, have measured and predicted stress. So, so grapes, wine grapes is a good example of where you may actually want stress and you may want to dial in a stress um, or if you have a limited water situation, you, you know what you can tolerate um, and how that will match up with your inputs and your predicted yield in the system. So um, that's in terms of um, precision technologies. And most of the others out in the, in the marketplace now, as um, Pablo has said, uh, they may they may seem like really new technologies, um, but they're they're they they're, they're easier easier delivered um, technologies such as NDVI for use calculating evapotranspiration. Um, but even those in in areas you know, and I think we we think about it as a uh, toolbox, and there's all the way up to the precision irrigation that there's a sort of thermal sensing. Um, but even some of, you know, using using something is better than nothing. And there's a lot more out in the marketplace um, than there probably was, uh, you know, uh, 10, 20 years ago. Um, and that's in the hands of, I guess, irrigators who are um, less techn technologically focused. Um, and so that for me is, is a really promising um, promising system. And um, the, you know, companies like Rubicon looking at those integrated solutions so I think, um, you know, we've had tools to define and measure what the deficit is to determine when to water and how much to apply. It's, it's been a little bit of art and a little bit of science determining what is that refill point um, to allow the crop to go to. And so with these newer technologies and sensors, um, uh, we're now able to better define using a, a crop stress index of where that refill point should be for each stage of growth for that crop. And it could be based on quality or it could be based on yield, as Rose was saying, with wine grapes or other horticulture crops. So, you know, I think um, integrating a whole range of sensors and technology that are thermal, spatial and site-specific measurement, also climatic. Um, we now got the tools and the computers compared to 10 years ago to be able to do that a lot more effectively. But we need to make it simple to use, actionable, and you know, ready for an, an irrigator to, to operate, whether it's a green green light, red light, or an amber light. It's got to be simple to use. And I think we've got to break through that and, and get that complexity and the science behind and the system and, and up the front, the user interface has to be simple to use. Right, thank you. There's a few, I'm just trying to decide what order to ask these audience questions about that logically flow on, but I, I'll start with this one, I think. There's a question here that says, are the ease of use poorly evident value over promises in the past, the prime blockers of uptake, or is it issues of integration into a single platform dashboard, issues of security, ownership and IP concern, and especially um, about around a risk of big brother, uh, overlooking operations, assured continuity of service? What's the kind of key blocker there, do you think? Uh, there's a lot of good points in that question, um, but just very quickly, I think um, it, it, it has to be end user focus. So designing the product has to be, you know, design thinking incorporated in what's the operator, what's going to be easy to, to use. The other thing is there's multiple platforms out there. How do we bring that together? So there's got to be collaboration between vendors um, to be able to work together and agree at a commercial level for, for the benefit of the end user who's using all types of irrigation methods of pivots, drip, flood irrigation, using a whole range of sensor technologies, you know, bringing that into a single platform. So there's a bit of work to be done in that space as well. Rose, did you? Yeah, so our research into into this um, particular area is the answer is yes, it's all those things. Um, the, um, the big brother data, um, the, the one of the, the tricky things I think in ag tech is that there's an assumption that farmers are new to technology and they're very cautious about um, flash in the pan type 
companies. So um, I think that that is a consideration that that um, that 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 customer focus, the farmer focus, and there is a hesitancy um, about you know taking on some tech, and then that company is going to go. And and but one of the one of the things we're seeing, and I know that we do start talking about US provider, is that that one of the difficulties for Australian tech companies in the past has been the small market size of, the, of, of Australian agriculture. And, um, and it's really exciting to see, I guess, in terms of spreading that risk, um, we're actually seeing a lot of our um, companies in, in Australia taking that overseas and scaling up that way. And that, that gives that, that risk of that cyclic operations. Um, and then in terms of the big brother, there are concerns about data sharing. Um, and the National Farmers Federation has, you know, have 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 actually delivered last year a kind of set of data um, privacy guidelines to follow. Um, and that those things, I think, they they need to be taken seriously. And they are more and more um, the, you know, the satellite in the sky type idea and those sorts of things. But but I think. When you come down to it, um, we can go back to another an example. And I know Google's tracking me, <laughs> but I still the once the inter the value the value add of the simplicity and the easiness and the integration of something, some of those other concerns can be addressed um, and overcome. And so it is the um, the biggest barrier in this space is around complexity and matching up to user needs, as Peter said. Thanks. Uh, Pablo, did you want to say anything? Otherwise, I'll go on to the, another question. I, I agree with uh, Peter and Rose about uh, what they said. Um, uh, just one little thing to add is I totally agree with the comment that uh, complexity, it's one of the key factors that uh, need to be solved. Sometimes we talk in a different language and that means that um, the potential end user doesn't fully understand because we don't explain it properly or because the ones who are trying to explain it properly are not um, speaking the same language of the science behind um, in all times. So I like to remind, I mean, one thing that happened to me when I was in California in one of the biggest um, pistachio and almond uh, areas. Um, and I remember um, that uh, the manager told me, Pablo, uh, because we were flying drones over there and, and getting thermal data to see the spatial variability of water stress. And I remember that uh, he said, Pablo, my dream is that every Monday when I sit here and I come back from the weekend, when I turn the computer on, um, I get an image showing the stress levels in the way that Peter said, like a red, a yellow, green. And I don't really care about what's behind, but I want to know if the stress levels that I'm getting in a very easy and simple way. I think that sometimes the problem is that from the scientific side, we are trying to deliver things which are probably too complex to be understood. And the, the ones um, receiving it don't really need to understand all the complexities. But on the other hand, I think that vendors offering these products need to understand as well that things don't need to be simple as the only ones that will work and that we need a bit of complexity, just not because we like complexity, but because we are trying to model systems which are not uh, easy. Thank you. I'm just going to... Um... I'm just going to turn now if we've got a few more questions coming in. So um, there's a question here that um, sort of speaks to adoption issues, but it, it's about remote sensing of ET and hence ag water use has been around for 30 years, but it's not caught on in Australia despite being routine in other parts of the world. Why do you think that that's the case? I'm happy to take this one, unless you want to, Pablo. Um, so one of the issues in Australia is that we um, already 
in a fairly water limited environment. So those those water balance type calculations are very good um, at improving water use efficiency where water is is overused, and so um, and bringing it back to a more sensible level. And so, for example, in the US, um, where water um, has not been regulated. Um, and um, perhaps there's been no, so it's a, sort of that first step in, in the equation. Um, it works, and it works very well um, at peak water use, um, but, but what, what um, Australian irrigators face is uncertainty, variable climate, um, um, a semi-arid environment is what most of our agricultural areas are in and um, needing to have something more precise than um, than the ET based models and 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 um, I, I, there is another question here about that simplicity um, and that that we need to know something works well and if you're comparing that kind of technology to say a soil sensor doesn't quite match up and there's a, there's a sort of a loss in confidence of that 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 approach but yeah very good tool when you're taking something from overwatering back to something more sensible. But, but as you start to um, have stress, it is less um, those sort of uh, ones that are based on crop cover, it's less able to detect the stress, which then has flow on effects. Um, if there's stress that impacts on water use, there, there you have, have difficulties in the calculation. Um, and so that, that's the, the, the big difference between our, irrig our irrigators and overseas irrigators. Thanks, Rose. Um, I might, there's a few questions coming in. So, um, might, this is a bigger picture one. This might be the last one we have time for, but the question is how do we balance the need for a diverse and healthy tech sector to support innovation in precision ag in Australia with the need for integrated systems supported by larger, more enduring companies? Are there lessons about how this can be done well um, from overseas, for example, Israel or California. Peter, do you want to have a go at that one? Yeah, I'm uh, currently based in California, um, although I'm sitting it out here in uh, Shepherd and Victoria at the moment. But um, what I've seen there quite effective is the connectivity between Silicon Valley um, and Salinas Valley or Central Valley. And so there are now these um, uh, hubs or accelerators that have been actually set up by uh, grower organisations like Western Growers who represent all the salad growers in, in Western US, setting up these technology hubs to bring in uh, the, 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 the tech wizards from Silicon Valley and to get, to get dirt under their fingernails, to get them into on farm with the members of the organization through this hub. So there's um, some interesting uh, observations there where they're bringing the city people and the, and the tech people to, uh, to the regions um, and to on farm, and, and there's a, a number of ways of facilitating that. And we're starting to see that emerge here in Australia with D D DPI in Victoria, with DPI in New South Wales, creating these um, tech hubs, ag tech hubs, to try and prove the technology and prove the benefit, and then to enable adoption. Great, thank you. Now, look, my apologies all, we're, we're, we're running out of time. And so I've, I know that we haven't quite got to all of the questions. Um, um, so my apologies, but um, it's been a really great discussion and I'm mindful that we need to respect people's time. So um, I think we'll just have to um, pause there and I'd just like to um, thank the panel uh, on behalf of the Water Environment and Agriculture Program, the University of Melbourne. Thank you so much for contributing to, your, to the discussion. Um, Rose, Peter, and Pablo. It's been really great to get that addition, get your insights and perspectives on this uh, on this issue. Um, it's very much. Um, it's been a great discussion, and thank you so much to the um, our audience. Thank you for your participation. Um, we would really like to. Um, um, get your feedback and we'd really appreciate your input on our post event survey which will appear on your screen when this session ends um, and it really uh, we very much value that it helps us shape our future um, it helps us shape our future seminars 
Um, do you really want to apologise that we haven't been able to respond to all of the questions? Uh, acknowledge that and appreciate your um, your contributions. Um, and um, that's been very helpful. My apologies, something just slightly distracted me. So thank you again. Thank you, panellists. Thank you, audience. And we would really appreciate it if you filled out the, the survey and keep an eye out for the next uh, series event, which will be announced soon. We have another event in October and November, so it would be great if you could join us then. Thanks all.